Well, hello, everybody, and thanks for coming today. I am uh, Jeremy Duran. I'm a principal architect for a <coughs> local company, and uh, mainly teach penetration testing and application security and uh, run our programs that, uh, such as bug bounty and penetration testing and things like that. And also own Ellipsis Information Security here locally and have a couple of projects. If you're interested in information security or uh, this talk today, you may want to check out the YouTube channel. I've already pre-uploaded an entire series of videos on basics of password cracking, advanced password cracking, and using the tools that we'll be talking about in here. So that, uh, I think it's about 15 or 20 video series is already up there for you. And with me today, I have Eric Jackson. Hi, and I'm also a penetration analyst for a similar logistic company. You can kind of say it might be the same one. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I work with networks and web applications, web service, mostly red teaming and vulnerability assessments. In my prior life, I was an app dev and project management person. I have a patent, if you want to talk about it, I can. And we have, I'm also an open source contributor, and I speak a lot. I have a different, and a couple of my projects include the USB Swiss Armory knife and a couple of phishing and exfiltration hacks. Thanks. So when you're doing a penetration test, it's a lot like a regular hacker who's trying to get into the system. That's actually the point. Sometimes it's called uh, threat simulation, adversarial simulation, but you're basically trying to recreate or replicate the conditions of a hack, and then you'll break down what happened, all the bad things that happened during that sequence of events, and then you can go about trying to patch those different points in that chain. And penetration testing is unlike regular hacking in that you have a very short window to get the work done. So you, you get a small scope to work on typically, and you've got maybe one week, maybe two weeks at the outside to get the job done, and at that point it's time for you to write your report. So there's no, uh, there's no hanging around for months and months and months and figuring stuff out. You basically got to get in there, get the job done, and get out. And therefore, automation is very important to us because there's a lot of repetitive tasks. And one of those particular repetitive tasks is password cracking. And I'll share with you some of what we learned in trying to automate that particular piece of the puzzle. Now, ideally, I'd really like to get to this point, and we're working on it, but we haven't quite got there yet. So right now, what we have is a series of the steps automated, and uh, like I said, one of those is password cracking, and then we've also made some efforts to automate the report writing and some other parts as well. Well, the first question is, is, is this task one of those ones that can be automated? And at first, it looks really good, because you have a very predictable sequence of steps that you're going through. Now it's complex, there's hundreds of steps, but nonetheless, it's the same steps over and over again. You start with this word list and try that, and then you try this dictionary in combination with this rule, and this other dictionary in combination with the same rule, and those dictionaries with the different rules, and so on and so forth. And by the time you get done, there's probably on a basic password cracking engagement, you're looking at around 130 to 150 steps. But again, very predictable. So that's in our favor. The problem is that with any particular set of passwords, context matters. And that's where the automation gets to be a little bit tricky. The context, context is things like the password policy. Also, you have a certain set of users and they speak a certain language or a set of languages by and large. The password policy itself dictates things like the minimum password length, the complexity that it has to attain, and the expiration date. And all of those induce some sort of pattern, some kind of behavior on the users that are using the system. So if you take the rules and dictionaries that you tried for one set of passwords that maybe worked really well, maybe you got 80% of them cracked and just had a fantastic time of it. You can take that exact same scenario and apply it to the next pen test and not get any passwords at all because of this context that's built in. So what you end up doing, or at least what we ended up doing, was we tried to figure out if there were certain patterns that were applicable across all the password sets. And it turns out, not really. There was some research done in this area by CoreLogic 
And they did a great job of figuring out what the most common 100 patterns are. And they published that work under their Pathwell project, which you can check out, it's still online. And they, they figured out that there's basically 100 different patterns that people follow on average. And I wanna say they got about 50% of passwords covered in these 100 patterns that they came up with. So that's pretty good. But that was based on a large set of passwords across a whole lot of systems. It wasn't necessarily about the system you're working on today. So depending on how the system in front of you is behaving, that type of general research maybe is a great fit or maybe it's not. It's, it's just going to be a matter of luck. So then we said, okay, is there a way to kind of redo this research that they were doing, but do it on the fly for the system that's in front of you? So for this particular engagement, can you effectively come up with the same patterns that are going to be effective, but do it in real time and have a tool that can repeat this process over and over again? Because again, two weeks from now, you'll be done with this test, you write your report, and you're on to the next test, and you'll be faced with a totally different adversary, potentially, possibly a, a different language even uh, for the set, certainly probably a different password policy. Also, let's say that you can find these patterns. Does it do any good? Do people behave alike? Just because you know the patterns that people are using to make their passwords doesn't mean that everyone is acting the same way. Because if people are not acting the same, then finding a pattern doesn't do you a lot of good. You might get one person's password, but maybe they're not the admin. And so maybe that one doesn't help you as much as you would like. And so can you apply this to large groups of people? <clears throat> so a little bit of background. When I say a pattern, I'm talking about the sequence of cat characters that make up <coughs> a password. Now, it doesn't have to be any particular letter or any particular number. I just mean things like with the word uh, pass one exclamation point. We started with an uppercase, and then we had three lowers in a row. We got a digit, and then finally we have a symbol on the end. So this would be a pretty common pattern is to have some series of letters that are uppercased, and then some number and some symbol is a common pattern. And you see a couple of other examples here with the one, two, three, four, five, six, which is all digits, and then the rollerball one, which is the 10 digits, and it's got a number on the end of it. As far as the nomenclature we use, we can uh, borrow the syntax used by popular password cracking programs like uh, John the Ripper and Hashcat that have the question mark followed by an L, U, D, or S, depending on if it's a upper or lower digit symbol. And the A is kind of a catch-all, so it just means it could be a lowercase or an uppercase or a digit or a symbol. It's basically any printable character is what the A means, so it's just a superset of all those combined together. Once you know about the patterns, the next thing to think about is the idea of a percentile. In other words, how many patterns would cover some percent of a given set of passwords? So say like I wanted to get 25% or at least have a pretty good chance of getting 25% of passwords in a big giant set of password hashes. How many patterns is it going to take in order to get that many passwords out of the set? Or you might even extend this to say 50%, so on and so forth. What you'll find is, is that the number of patterns required for a given set of passwords follows this type of curve here, which is an exponential distribution. Depending on the system and how good your password cracking is and so forth, the curve is going to kind of move a little bit one way or the other, but it's generally going to be a ski slope. And it may have a little bit of a funny shape depending on the situation. So I got a quiz for you. And uh, if you've caught my presentation on bypass, this is a, a different example, so that answer won't work. So take 72 million passwords taken just from a whole lot of different systems. So we're talking pretty generic here. And let's say that I set the percentile for you at 50%. So that means you need to figure out what patterns it takes to get 50% of those 72 million passwords, which is about 36 million, give or take, how many patterns would you all guess it takes to get that huge group of passwords? Any ideas? Starting number? Five. 
Five. Okay, we got five to start with. Optimist, I like it. Hundred. Hundred. It's a pretty good guess too. Three. Three. Ooh, man. You have way more faith than that. <laughs> I won't be able to deliver <laughs> on that one. <laughs> so, any other guesses? We haven't got the right answer yet, but but you're, you're surrounding it. <laughs> All right, so it actually takes about 21 patterns to cover 36 million. So the, the optimists definitely win. And what we ended up seeing is if, if you really only need like a whole bunch of passwords, but not even half, then really about six patterns will do because we hit the 25% mark when we reach pattern number six. Now these statistics are biased in one way. <clears throat> these passwords that were used in this example were taken from a huge number of password breaches, which means you had a whole lot of different password policies, a whole lot of different users all coming together. And what that tends to do is it tends to make it to where you actually need more patterns than less because you have a larger group of password policies and stuff that you're trying to cover. So if you thought it was bad when you first saw this slide, <coughs> it's really bad when you hear that this is actually made up from a whole bunch of different systems and theoretically we should need a few <coughs> more patterns to kind of compensate for the fact that different systems were contributing their passwords. So what this tells us is <coughs> Not only do people kind of act alike, but even the people who are designing the password <coughs> policies kind of think alike, right? They all tend to come up with use eight characters and let's use a, an upper and a lower or let's use two out of four. Like you have to have two uh, upper lower symbol digits, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, people are kind of mimicking each other when they set up these systems when they pick their password policies, which kind of makes sense because if you're a system admin and you're about ready to implement some kind of policy, what's the first thing you do when you want to know what policy you should use? Google, exactly. And what you'll get is, by the nature of Google itself, is you'll get a consensus, right? Because that's kind of what... Google does, in a, in a sense, is it brings up the most relevant search results according to its algorithm, which most people are going to see, and so you sort of end up getting this uh, confirmation bias built in where people start acting alike. And these, these were certainly no exception. If we break down that set into a picture, we get a diagram that looks kind of like this. So you can kind of imagine the distribution curve here, and the part that's colored in there on the left, that thin little part that's colored in is the 50%. And you can see, compared to the entire width of that curve, how narrow that little band is. But we kind of already knew that, right? Because we already knew that it only took 21 patterns out of hundreds of thousands of patterns in order to represent the 50%. <clears throat> What's really interesting is, if, take a look at how many patterns there are. There's 412,000 patterns needed to cover 72 million passwords. So there's a whole lot of people that have a unique password in that set. We would agree because we see that there's just a tremendous number of patterns represented. <clears throat> but realistically, if you're doing a pen test, do you care about cracking all the passwords? No, not really, right? You just need to get in. You're just trying to get access. Any one will do, as long as it's got sufficient privileges, as long as it's, you know, at least a user account. If not, an admin account would be nice, uh, but, you know, at least a user account, right? And so, <clears throat> if you're trying to win a, a password cracking contest, you're kind of worried about the long tail on this curve. But if you're just trying to get in, and you don't care how you get in, the colored region there on the left will do <coughs> just fine. <laughs> and what that ends up teaching us when, with what we were working with is that when it got to about right here, we just stopped caring because from the 130th pattern over to the 400,000th pattern are just onesies, twosies. Like they, they're not going to help us. They don't really make any difference. So we can ignore those and we can focus in on just the really common patterns. 
And that's definitely to our advantage because again, two week engagement, you're in a hurry, you gotta get this done really, really fast. And cracking passwords is not the point, right? The point is, is getting in and finding vulnerabilities so you can help your customer fix the problems. Well, it turns out this pattern actually holds up. You might say, well, that only worked because you were looking at all these passwords brought together and there's just this massive number of those passwords and it's just such a huge sample that it worked out. But I looked at small samples like uh, the Facebook <coughs> and Hotmail dumps that were out there and I looked at some bigger samples like the singles.org and the MySpace and also took a look at uh, some other combinations, the Rock View Dictionary that's so popular. And it doesn't matter which one you look at, the general shape of the curve holds up. And by and large, if you find the top 10 patterns, you'll end up seeing that the top 10 patterns tends to fall right about near the middle of the curve, or the curve has its tangent point. <clears throat> so I got a demo for you to kind of illustrate some of this. See if I can wake this up. Okay. Uh, so I went to Ryan Bose's site. He has some password dumps that were <coughs> already turned into text files that you could just download. His site is skullsecurity.com. And I grabbed uh, some of those ones that I showed you, plus a couple of other ones. I also went out to uh, Mark Burnett's site and grabbed his, uh, I guess you pronounce it Zato, it's X-A-T-O. Um, that's where I ended up getting the 72 million password set. And uh, so appreciate uh, those two folks putting those out there so that I could grab those. <clears throat> the software package that we wrote based on what we learned is called Bypass. And Bypass will automatically take a set of hashes it will run through those 130 steps I described, get as many passwords as it can based on several different languages and a whole lot of different rules. And then it'll apply this analysis to figure out what the patterns are so that it can go about taking it to the next level. <coughs> the program that is inside of the bypass package that does the actual analysis for bypass is called Pastime. And so I'll show you Pastime. And this is all available for free on my GitHub. And I'll share my contact information with you at the end if you're interested in going out to GitHub and grabbing that. <laughs> so in this first one, we take a look at the Hotmail at 50%. So the first thing that Pastime does is it'll draw an approximation roughly of the exponential distribution curve. Now it's, it's ASCII art, so it's really crude, but it gives you a general idea and we can see that the first pattern is worth 9% all by itself, and then the second pattern gets you another about 7%, so you're already up to 15% just in, in a couple patterns. I had told it that I was interested in a 50% percent percentile. That's what the 0.5 represents. And so these, these nine patterns are the ones that you would need in order to get half of that set. And then it actually goes about the business of telling you what those patterns are. So in this particular set, it was these this series of lowers, a couple more lowers for the second one, one less lower for the third one, a bunch of digits. So you can kind of tell that that password set has not a great pattern to it. And one thing about users is they will definitely live down to your expectations. So whatever pattern you pick is pretty much going to be the pattern that's going to be number one in the percentile. So if if you tell folks, hey, you've got to pick upper, lower, and digit, and you tell them it has to be nine characters, you can bet pattern number one or number two is going to be U, L, 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 L for seven times, and then followed by, or eight times followed by a D. Because not only do users do exactly what you tell them, even though you're not really trying to tell them something with their password policy, but you are, <clears throat> they literally keep it in order. 
So they always do the upper first on average, followed by the lowers on average, and then followed by the digits on average, and then the symbols on average. So unfortunately, they are somewhat predictable as a, as a group. Now an individual, that's a whole different story. So what you'll notice is that when hackers go after particular people, they're not so predictable. And that's why you'll see things like spear phishing and other techniques being used because guessing a particular person's password, not that easy. But guessing what the group did on, on average, very easy. <clears throat> They'll just follow the, the pattern exactly. You'll see the actual mass printed out down here at the bottom. And that's mainly just in case you need them in the form of a list. Right. <clears throat> so now let's take it up to the to the 90th percentile. So I'll show you the the 90 percent of the same set, and it's pretty remarkable what happens. Get this huge number of patterns that you would have to have to get to the to the 90th percentile. So what's basically happening here is, <coughs> on average, people that's plural do behave somewhat alike, but persons don't. So as you get lower, as you get trying to cover more and more passwords, you're running into more and more unique individuals who don't act like the herd. And you're picking those up and you're getting that long tail on that exponential distribution curve. So the pattern holds up really well right down through the 50th percentile. That's here under this, the CP column. CP is the cumulative. <clears throat> and, but in order to go from 50 to 90, you really got to work hard. Now again, if you're trying to get all the passwords, that would be important to you, but if you're just doing pen testing and you just need some, don't worry about it. Just focus in on the top 10 patterns, get, get the access you need and move on with your test. <clears throat> so another, uh, another set is MySpace. And this one is, this one's getting a little bit um, dated now, but it's got a lot of passwords in it, so I kind of like it for that reason. By dated, I mean the policy is, is old because MySpace is old. <clears throat> in this case, it took 12, and uh, we ended up figuring out that uh, the 12 patterns mean that they had a little bit better of a policy at that time compared to what the Hotmail did at, at their time. Um, of course, Hotmail's policy is, is better now. In fact, they have two-factor today, but this is years ago. And, uh, but it's still not that many more to get to 50th percentile. So we try to take it out to the, the 90th. And again, just an absolutely huge number. And it just continues to emphasize that a big chunk of users will behave exactly like each other in any large user community. And then the individuals start to stand out after you get it to about the, the 50 percentile mark. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learned this is a, a useful technique to use if you're just trying to get a few passwords and you don't care about getting all of them. Works great. And that's exactly how Bypass was able to automate most of the password cracking is it simply gets as many passwords as it possibly can using all the conventional techniques, every which way, every which combo. It tries everything and it gets as many as it can. Then it uh, recycles the passwords, which I'll let Eric tell you a little bit more about. And after the recycling is done, it uses that information, all those passwords that it cracked, lets Pastime do the analysis on it. Pastime will say, hey, Bypass, try these 9, 10, 12 patterns and see how that works. So to give you some idea of how effective it is, if you have a set of about 2,000 passwords out of a pretty large set of hashes and you run this analysis on it, it typically will be able to get around 250,000 more from that 2,000. So it has a, a pretty good amplification factor on it. And again, it's because people do really do behave alike. The other thing we learned from this from a defender's point of view is we need something better for our users than passwords. So the main thing that we can give them today is two-factor authentication. If you think about the popular social media sites, 
online email, and a whole lot of major brands. You have Apple, Facebook, all the different Google properties, all the different Microsoft properties, including Hotmail and Outlook, and now the different Amazon properties. Even the Amazon store now has free two-factor authentication. And all you have to do is opt in. It's really easy to do, and, and you kind of do have to have a, a mobile phone, but that's really much of a barrier um, for our users today. Uh, also, if you're getting two-factor for your own company, the price of implementing that has really come up a lot. In fact, there's, there's actually a few free solutions that are okay. Uh, of course, free means that you better have a lot of time on your hands uh, in order to implement it. But even the paid solutions have really come down in price quite a bit. Now, let's say that you've got some sites left over after you do two-factor. <clears throat> so you go home and you go through all your social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, the whole nine yards, and you get all your two-factor set up on those, you go through all your email accounts, get it set up on those, and, and you've done everything you can. you still got a few sites left over at the end of the day, and they don't have two-factor available for you. <clears throat> what you can back down to is using a password manager. So you can get a password manager like a LastPass or a 1Password or whatever brand you want, and you can let those tools generate the password for you they effectively generate more or less random passwords. So they're not going to fit any kind of a pattern like you would see presented here today. And because of that, you won't be able to use techniques like this in order to get that. Now, I, I still would recommend two-factor because we're only talking about one particular attack here. We're talking about just uh, guessing the password effectively, right? There's still interception. There's still phishing. There's other ways to get passwords besides just this one technique. So you still want to have that two-factor. Just having a random password won't save you from interception or disclosure. But on the sites that can't support two-factor, the best thing you can do is, is try to get the password manager set up. Then you can use these crazy passwords that you would never be able to remember in a million years anyway and, uh, and let the password manager handle the storage. Uh, naturally, you would have to have two-factor on the password manager, but most of them pretty well force it on you nowadays. They, they nag you until you do it. So, All right. And I did leave out a little bit about that recycling technique, so let me it, turn it over to Eric, and he'll explain recycling. Thank you. Uh, working with this pro on this project with Jeremy was great because we share a lot of the same interests, and this was uh, one where we could kind of collaborate. I'd already put some effort in Bypass before, Mostly because my daughter told me when I told her why I did, she's like, I bet I can think of a password you can't guess. And she was right. She came up with an anime character. That's why Bypass now has an anime dictionary, so you can thank my daughter for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we wanted to do was automate password cracking. As we said, and as Jeremy's mentioned before in different presentations, pen testers are lazy in a good way. We want to make it the best use of our time because we have to focus very clearly on the, de the deadlines that we have. The recycle technique that was proposed was we would generate guesses from passwords that were already cracked and, by ge and generate new words that would be new entities that rules would apply on. It's sort of a magical alchemy where we're taking something out of nothing and getting more from it. What I mean by that is we have, look at this password here. We're chopping things off to the right, and each time we do, that's a new character or a new word. It also can be made into some additional words. It could be lowercase, and it can have a root word. For example, the root word here is password, which also could be a root word, or a lowercase. <coughs> As we put these um, words together, we remove any sort of duplicates, and those were put back into the password list. There's a lot to unpack there, so let's really talk about what we did and how we applied it. Now, we are both are scientists at heart. We wanted to apply this because we knew something was there, but we wanted to find out how effective uh, our theory was and where it was most effective. So the best thing to do is, you know, apply the scientific method. You have your baseline, your control group, and then you control for variables. If you want to do this at home, here's the procedure. I'm sure everyone will do that tonight, right? No? Okay, well, um, when you do, you obtain John the, John the Ripper, get the Jumbo version. And I'm going to put bypass into the picture right now. And we'll include one rule to roll them all in the configuration, which I'll explain that to you in a bit. If you're not familiar with rules, we'll do a quick overview. Then assemble a large dictionary. The what dictionary we use is we took all the dictionaries that were in bypass, combined them into one massive uber dictionary, 
uniqueness is sorted to get rid of any sort of duplicates or um, passwords that overlap. And then we took baseline counts for what was correct with public uh, public dumps from LinkedIn and eHarmony. Now, in case you're not aware, these public dumps do not include anyone's ID with them. They're just the hashes. So we're not like finding IDs and then you're going off and spending people's money. This is just a way for us to baseline the process. Pretty standard way if you're going to test out a rule or just go against something that exists already. If you're going to run this directly, you'd run, here's our gigantic word list, one rule to rule them all, and then what we're cracking against. Pretty basic thing to run. The rounds, what we tested, and this is the experimental part, is how many we would chop off from the right. N being the number that we would chop off, and that would also be the name of the round. So we thought, let's do five rounds. I'll give you a spoiler. It didn't take more than five rounds to figure out where it was most efficient. We made a new word list with N, those many characters trimmed from the right. If we cut more from the length, then the password obviously was not included in the list. We would calculate the lowercase root word and lowercase of the word and swear you naked, and remove john.pot to attack it again. If you're not familiar with John the Ripper, I don't know anyone's experience to hear with John the Ripper. Do you know why we would remove john.pot? Because that holds all the hashes that have been cracked. So uh, John's not going to waste any time when the hashes already been cracked. We want to know the numbers that have been. So we've, we remove the hashes that have been cracked and rerun it again. That way we'll see how many more were cracked. There's different ways to apply it, but that's, that's the way that we did it. Incidentally, does anyone know why it's called john.pot instead of like john.txt? It was originally going to be called Jack, like Jack the Ripper, but uh, the name would be jack.pot, you know, I guess infosec humor. But kind of interesting trivia, if you have trivia night in your infosec pub, you can win something like that way. Uh, same pa password attack as before. So just looking at it from here, we combine the password list, combine them into the super password list, unique it, sort it, put it to John Jumbo. Same thing, except the big difference, I can't use this thing. <coughs> is it a top one? Yeah. Ah, always wanted to use this. Uh, we're uh, adding that additional one that's recycling back into the bigger list. You might realize that list is going to get increasingly bigger every round. So, which is true, it will. But what we're doing, password lists are hard to come by. If you're like using cool to take stuff off a um, CEWL to get off um, password list off a person's website, how can you get more passwords? You can use existing password dictionaries. That's why I'm saying that we're doing sort of an alchemy. We're taking something and making it into more. <coughs> we had, so here we were chopping off from the right, and we're passing it into um, John the Ripper using one rule to rule them all. If you're not familiar with rules, the idea is that you mangle these entities. Mangle is a word people don't like. It's the official word, though, where it expands the password in some way. It changes the case as numbers, symbols, applies those patterns that we just saw. The one rule to rule them all rule was put together by a group called Not So Secure, I think was the group. They have a GitHub. They took the top 25% performing rules from all the best rule sets they could. It results in a gigantic rule that takes forever for your browser to display. Best to curl it down to your PC and just include it into your config. It runs a, long, a longer time. But that's how we're running it for our baseline. So we're working the 25% best rules in this, uh, this way of determining what works best. Again, these rules apply individually to each one of those. So when you look at, um, yeah, I cannot try this thing. Each one of those words is now going to be an ent a entity unto itself, meaning that each rule will apply to itself. That's the magic to it. So I'm going to show you a bunch of numbers here. Don't worry, this is not really a slide on the results. Down on the right, or uh, left, you'll see the different password dumps we use. LinkedIn and eHarmony. The uh, numbers that we tracked and how much we saw from total, which is interesting. What you really want to look at is the yellow bar across in each round that we did. You can see immediately, I'm just chopping one word character off the right, a 14% increase just from what we would have cracked normally. At eHarmony, that's 23%. And I want to emphasize, that's basically from nothing. That's for free, just by changing something a little bit. Uh, look at <coughs> minus two. Again, additional uh, increase from the previous one, which I'll go into detail in a moment. And a total 21% from LinkedIn and 35% increased amount of passwords just by doing that. Those first three rounds, you can see, I mean, right here, 40% uh, increase from three rounds, which is fantastic. I would take that. 
I've got an additional 40% test with crack. Now, with all things, watches, wine, when you spend money on it, eventually you get diminishing returns. We want to see what the diminishing return is, and you can kind of see it already at n minus 4 and n minus 5. It's kind of leveling off. This shows 24 to 25 to 25%. Really not, not great there. You can not really see it clear on these curves. And we would anticipate if you generalize this to other data sets, or reproduce it yourself, we would, I, we would expect the same type of curve. The first three, n minus one, n minus two, and n minus three, are worthwhile investments because we are getting additional data, or additional um, hashes crack. It levels off very clearly with both of those data sets. Now that's the total crack per round. Look at the increase per round. Now the percent increase per round was determined by how many crack did we crack this time, Subtract that from what we cracked before and divide it by what we cracked before to get an efficiency rating per round. This is actually how much more per the baseline, how much we <coughs> crack if we didn't actually do this recycle technique. You can see that this average line mirrors exactly where we're going to anticipate on this curve. Looks kind of similar to the other one. And it levels off very clearly on n minus 1, n minus 2, and n minus 3. You see a definite effect right there on that middle one, we have a right at 30% crack on average is what we would anticipate just by doing this additional technique. Now I want to show the cost versus effectiveness. Uh, I wasn't on the pen test that we did this on, but we have heard out a PC before cracking passwords. So you, it's a very intense process. If you use Hashcat, you'll know it has a temperature monitor. This is the reason why. It runs very hard on the processor and it can harm your processor if you run it too long. So you want to know, not just from a time perspective, but processor expensive perspective, what your expenses are and what you're getting for it. If you look at this graph here, you can see that we have uh, an increasing cost, not a very fast acceleration. It's about 80% of the previous increase each time. Uh, and you can see that right, generally around here, it looks like we're getting something for it. You can barely see anything for the cost that we're getting here, and we're adding a lot more overhead to it. I really like this thing. I think I'm going to find one just to play around with it. So, um, yeah, so that, uh, it's not going to surprise me when I say that we recommended three additional recycles. And the way this would be incorporated and bypassed, which when I present this to Jeremy, our, our findings, he uh, incorporated to bypass really quickly. Uh, chop and rerun the password list that we get. Place in the bypass and attack your John Jumbo. Remember, the whole point of bypass is to make John the Ripper easier for you and save your time, your time during the very short amount of time you have to attack a system. This doesn't add additional, much additional time and gives you so many more passwords <coughs> just from that. So as I said, I recommend rounds for efficiency, three additional rounds for recycled. Your average increase effectiveness should be somewhere around the 35% range. Of course, your mileage may vary depending on your targets, depending on people's practices and strengths. If people have really difficult policies, maybe it will be harder for you to get through. If they have really easy ones, you should have an even bigger increase. But generally speaking, an average of 35% is what we would imagine seeing. But even at n minus 1, the increase of 20% additional passwords, who's not going to take that? I take 20% right now. And how often do you get something for free? Like, this is that's one of the great things about it. <clears throat> now, here is something where we took the recycle technique and put, uh, put it against eHarmony. Well, what kind of passwords would you have for eHarmony? Probably things like I love you, I L U V U, I W V U V U. Oh, it's so painful, but we put them all in there and um, uh, ran them through to see how much would crack. Now, if you look right here, we cracked 55 in the initial run, just without recycling anything. With recycle, that's nearly 2,000 more cracked just by recycling back, way above the percentage. And that is great because we're using a bunch of different additional patterns and using bypass for why it does. That is astonishing. And that's, that's when we knew that we really had something to show people. Uh, how do you run this now? Well, what's the big difference between script kidding and professional? We know as a professional how the tools are used. So we've given you the, st the statistics, you know, the scientific reasoning behind it. But we also want to make it easy for you. So just add that dash R 
uh, a band of bypass, and it'll do the recycle technique for you and do the full rounds. You don't have to specify anything further. It will run everything correctly for you. And that's one of the next ones. Thank you. Yep, so uh, go ahead and throw our combined contact information up here. And the GitHub is the uh, is my same handle, the weaponized handle, same as the YouTube channel, and same as Twitter as well. And uh, while we'll leave this up here, and we'll go ahead and take any questions that you might have. Yes? You mentioned the process is pretty computationally expensive for processors and stuff. Yes. Um, so I didn't know if like you had like considered like CUDA framework to maybe like make it make it faster or like maybe take able to process more. <coughs> yes, uh, we looked into it. Pretty expensive yeah, to buy the GPUs, <laughs> and um, I think the GPU prices went up because people are using it for like crypto mining and stuff mm -hmm. like that, yeah. and it kind of got out of out of hand there for a while, and yeah. they're still pretty expensive. So um, definitely looked into that. Also looked into using Hashcat. Um, so, so trusted sec, uh, has already written a tool based on Martin Boz's research that, uh, effectively does the same thing as bypass, but for Hashcat. So if you do use GPUs, if you have access to them and you have the funds to back it up, we don't, um, <laughs> if you do have GPUs, first of all, I would switch to Hashcat. And secondly, I would use uh, Martin's tool or the tool that they built based on, on what Martin had explained. Uh, because it's designed for GPU use. Uh, our budget was um, a little bit lower. We had zero dollars and some <laughs> good wishes uh, and a hearty handshake. And, uh, and so with that, we, we turned that uh, into, um, we built a VM and we ran the VM on a laptop. The first one, which Eric mentioned, we fried. Um, so now we're running on the second one. And uh, it's just a leftover laptop running uh, VirtualBox or VMware or whatever. And that's why it was so important that bypass work really smart because um, we don't have a lot of horsepower to just brute force our way through it. Yeah. And so we're going to, we literally have millions of less CPU cycles than what you're talking about right. having available. And because of that, we had to be really careful with how we use those CPU cycles. And that was the original driver behind why we got into uh, doing all this in the first place is figuring out how to do more with less. <clears throat> Any other questions? <clears throat> awesome. Well, if uh, if you're curious about how to use bypass and you didn't catch our talk on bypass specifically, uh, you can go out to the YouTube channel. <coughs> I've got about I don't know 425 or whatever videos out there now, and about 20 of them are on a uh, tutorial series that slowly walks you through. How do I use John? How do I install John? How do I install Bypass? How do I use Bypass with John? And so on and so forth. Included in that series is a uh, subset of videos that covers using Pastime to show exactly what we show today. And that both of those tools are included in the same GitHub. Again, it's, it's the weaponized GitHub. So, all right, well, thank you very much.